Welcome. You're listening to Latin Waves with your hosts, Sylvia and Stuart Richardson. Latin Waves is more than just hot rhythms. This is a show about community, about creating a culture that is inclusive and based on fairness. Because everyone deserves dignity, respect, and has something to contribute. A new world is possible, and it all starts with us. Dr. Robert Jensen has recently written the book, An Inconvenient Apocalypse. It's coming out in September and is co-authored with Wes Jackson. Can I, I, can I say a bit about that title? Just because yes. the word apocalypse and apocalyptic can sometimes suggest a, a very reactionary religious perspective that says the end of the world is coming. I hope the title, An Inconvenient Apocalypse, is appropriately um, sort of playful. Uh, what we're talking about is the ecological crises mm. and the way in which we are really at a precipice in human history here. Uh, we're not predicting, you know, the rapture. We're using the term in a very secular way to, to signal that this is a dramatic moment in human history, and, and we need to pay attention. So I don't want to be misunderstood with that rather playful title. When we think about the the response, right, the response to the crisis of COVID-19 was to shut down, you know, yeah. basically send people home. Um, and here in Canada, we've had recently some serious protests by yeah. truckers and and the immediate response uh by the prime minister was to just label them right and uh in disregard yeah. and i have no doubt that there are people among that protest that you know have racist attitudes and yeah. views of others and yet part of me says unless we're able to speak and communicate with people we don't see eye to eye with we're never going to co-create a world that has justice at the core you know we're always replicating the things that we abhor right we 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 denounce yeah. violence but then we use violence to censor yeah. and, and coerce others you know, the trucker convoy and the whole question about um, pandemic policy is, I think, really, really important to, to tease out. So you're absolutely right um, that the trucker convoy, let's just talk about that, had a variety of different kinds of people and different influences. Uh, some of it was a very uh, ugly, racist, um, kind of reactionary right wing force that is certainly strong in the United States. And in fact, some of the money and, and planning for that trucker convoy did come from the United States. I'm sorry, it's one thing I don't want to export to Canada. Uh, right? At the same time, some of the people in that convoy were now, no doubt very well-intentioned and, and scared of what federal power can do. Right? At the same time, it's also true that in the face of a pandemic that could have you know, killed many, many more people than it did, uh, dramatic government action in the form of lockdowns and, uh, for me, mask mandates, which I support, and vaccine mandates, which I support. Right? Um, without that government action, we would be in far more dire straits. The question is, when should a government-imposed lockdown be lifted? When should kids be allowed back in school without masks? Now, I think those are difficult questions, and I don't think science answers them. You know, some people say, well, I follow the science. Well, science can't give you an answer to the question of balancing the interests of children's education. And there's no doubt that children's education suffered during the lockdown. Everybody agrees on that. So when does the threat of pandemic spread uh, justify the lockdown, and when do you have to, to let go of that because the mental health and educational constraints on children are so important. Well, nobody has an answer to that. And I think you're absolutely right. We need to be able to talk better about that. But unfortunately, at least in the United States, I think the most important impediment to that, to critique, is the, the rise of this reactionary right wing, I would say, profoundly irrational approach to politics and to the world more generally, uh, that says whatever people who we identify as left or liberal whatever they want must be bad. Right? And it's hard to talk to somebody who says, I oppose whatever you want because of who you are. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're in a kind of standoff, and I don't have an easy resolution to it. Uh, you know, in most 
examples where there's a, a bitter polarization like this, the, the kind of standard answer is, well, what do we have in common? How can we look to commonality before we try to identify differences? Because you have to identify the differences as well. And the problem is when one side says, I'm not interested in identifying commonalities, I'm interested in destroying your political movement, then it's hard. And so I, I think everybody has a, a role in trying to resolve this. But I also think it's appropriate to point to this reactionary right-wing irrationality and recognize that it is the primary driver of the problem at the moment. When we lose connection to the earth, when we lose connection to uh, the natural ecosystems that sustain life, when we lose our empathy for the sentient beings that coexist with us, um, it's not very long before we start to lose compassion for each other. It's not very long before we start to feel no empathy for our enemies, right? Someone who we, we don't identify with. Um, and uh, I, I had a conversation with someone at, at the gym, and she said, you know, it was my husband's a developer, and they wanted to develop the swath of land. And he said, we should wait because the bears are still hibernating. And it's all oh, nonsense. There's nothing there. So they clear cut of this area and they bump into a, a, ben, a, a bear's den. And, uh -huh. and, you know, so this happens every day. And we don't think about, you know, other beings, you know, coexisting. We, like we talked right. about modernity, this idea that modernization just meant, you know, um, capitalism, you know, takes place, take, you know, takes priority, the dams, the mines, the whatever it is to get the money and to get, um, to, to accumulate wealth takes priority, right? And everything else is, well, not as important. So yeah. how do we rekindle and reignite in ourselves that commitment to life when everything around us is shining a bit like a big light of uh -huh. an impending, you know, futile ending, right? You know, I think of my own life. I was born in 1958. I grew up in a small state, a small city, but still in a city. And um, I had no, you know, daily contact with the larger living world. I lived in the human built environment. Uh, and this was in Fargo, North Dakota. You talk about places like New York, it's even more dramatic, a, a detachment from the larger living world. And so if you have no connection to that, I think your question is very important. How do you develop uh, an ability to see other life as not equally valuable to your own? I mean, I value you know, the, the life of my spouse more than the life of the skunk that is outside our house these days, you know. Uh, so it's not about pretending every life has exactly the same value to us. It's recognizing that we live in a web of life and that as other species are destroyed, we're not only doing something that might feel wrong, we're also undermining the ability of ecosystems to sustain our lives. So there's both a self-interest and then a larger philosophical, you know, you could say even emotional connection to the world we should be paying attention to. So how do you rekindle that in um, people who have not had that experience? And, you know, increasingly, of course, even people's experience of what we call nature is often, you know, through screens. People have apps to go out and look at the stars. I remember the first time I, I was out at night looking at stars and somebody pulled out their uh, smartphone because they had an app that helped you identify the constellations. Well, that's kind of a banal example, but there a screen is getting in the way of your ability to just look up into the sky and feel whatever you feel. Some people say, well, that that's not really the question. The question is policy. How do you get Congress to pass laws and you know corporations to change policy and that? But I think you're absolutely right. At the core of it is a, a, a much deeper experience. And how do you do that? Um, I don't have a good answer, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, a little story about how somebody answered it. Once my co-author, Wes Jackson, I, I was listening, before I'd ever met him, I was listening to give a lecture uh, about uh, the problem of industrial agriculture. 
and a young person got up and and asked, well, how do I call my member of Congress to change this? You know, how do I immediately, you know, enact some new policy? And Wes gave what I thought was a very interesting answer. He said, before you decide what you're going to tell your member of Congress, he said, go plant a tomato plant in a coffee can in your apartment. In other words, he was saying, you living in a city have no connection to the food you eat, right? And what would happen if you tended a tomato plant? Well, obviously, you know, you can't feed yourself from one tomato plant, but it does start to to regenerate that connection you're talking about between we humans and other forms of life. And so I think anything that gets people out into the, what I keep calling the larger living world, because I don't like that term nature. You know, we're part of nature. The human is as much a part of nature as anything else. But there is a larger living world beyond the world that humans build. And any time you can get out in that, it's good. And, you know, even psychologists will now say that one response to depression is to get outside you know, to, to get your hands dirty, to, you know, go experience something beyond the human. So when psychologists are telling, you know, it's a treatment for depression, I think uh, we should, you know, be scared because of how disconnected so many of us are. And I don't, you know, exempt myself from that. I'm still, I feel like I'm a recovering uh, product of the industrial age. You know, I'm every day trying to remember what it's like to be out in that larger living world. And it's really, it's both distressing, uh, but it's also exciting to think we can reconnect like that. I love that you make um, the connection between tending to life and reconnecting Mm -hmm. to life. Um, I have granddaughters now, and one of the things that I love doing with them is planting seeds. And the little one, the baby, is only 10 months. She's walking. She's not walking. Mm-hmm. She's running now. She's so cute. But one of the things I noticed is that she discovered how to step on a stool this week. And she got herself up on the stool. And as she pulled mm-hmm. herself so up, she celebrated for one second. Like, yay, I did it. Right? She was very happy. And she wanted to make sure that I noticed she did it. And then immediately she proceeded to turn around and get engaged trying to reach the top of the counter. So I I feel we're constantly growing and trying to reach higher and trying to, and I think the the basics of being able is to cultivate, you know, where are we planted, right? Because the first thing she did was make sure she had her feet planted safely on this stool and then she could reach out. And I, I feel like with your story that the, the, the rooting of ourselves is that connection to tend into life in some meaningful way so that we can then speak from an experiential sense of, you know, yeah. being yeah. part of that web of yeah. life. Um, in, in your book, you are talking about very difficult topics of overpopulation and all the, th- the ways that we have you know, not only compromise our living ecosystems and our, you know, the larger living world, how do we reconcile the harm and, I guess, move towards co-creating with life? Um, you know, you have to work really hard to, to kind of beat the creativity out of children, you know, um, and unfortunately a whole lot of schooling does exactly that. But you're pointing out that we are naturally creative, and I think that's important because the whole world is naturally creative. You know, now, uh, you know, the larger living world, what Wes and I always call the ecosphere, it doesn't have intention. It's not a, you know, an organism with a, a mind that's setting out to do things with intention. But the creativity of the world is just stunning when you start to think about it. Um, and we are part of that world, and we have that same instinct for creativity. Uh, and so anything that is going to make the world more livable to slow the destruction of the modern industrial machine is going to have to draw on our creativity, uh, but not only in the way that the industrial world rewards it, because you know, if you want to be creative and you know, invent a new video game, well, you'll get rewarded for that. But what about the creativity of, you know, going into your own backyard, looking at a commercial 
lawn, you know, with grass that requires mowing and all that. And the creativity of saying, what could this backyard be if it wasn't just a typical suburban lawn? Well, that's not going to change the world overnight, but it's, it's going to it's going to get us thinking in new ways. So uh, I don't want to suggest that traditional politics, you know, organizing social movements, trying to pressure politicians to change course, trying to affect the laws, trying to get better people elected. I'm not saying none of that's important. Of course, it's crucial. But I think it's going to be more effective if it goes forward with more of us trying to think about that experience you're talking about. And not only for ourselves, but but conveying that to children as well, because children are getting other messages from the media, from the corporations, and unfortunately from so much of their schooling uh, about what's valuable. And so we have to change that story about what's of real value. And, you know, everybody knows what's of real value, community and connection. You know, the, the song is money can't buy you love, not money buys love. <laughs> You know, uh, some of these are such basic truths that everybody understands that we just have to remind ourselves of them, that mm-hmm. human beings spread around the world and became the dominant species precisely because of cooperation, connection, community, collaboration. Those are the things that made us such a, an incredible species at expanding our presence in the world. Now we just have to use those same skills to slow and we hope eventually reverse the destruction of those natural forces. You do realize that community also requires our ability to learn to also wonder, right? Like to also be curious about each other. I I wonder how... How has teaching not only inform um, your curiosity, but perhaps nourished it? Yeah. Well, I taught at the University of Texas at Austin, which was a very large campus and had a um, a student body that drew from all over the world. And so it was a great place to not only learn more myself, but to, to see other students engaging. Um, and so uh, let me just give you an example of, I think, how how this plays out. Um, At one point, the University of Texas would have basically been all white and mostly Texan, right? The students were drawn from Texas and people of color were largely excluded. Well, if you walk into a classroom at UT today, it's quite different. And students are often curious. So if you're from West Texas, from a small town, and everybody you ever knew was a white Christian Republican, all of a sudden you're in a new environment. And Students are curious, but it's not always easy to engage. So if you see a student from uh, another part of the world or a student who obviously have ancestors from another part of the world, how do you start that conversation in a way that's inviting and not potentially alienating? Uh, So let me give it just a a good example. Uh, We had a lot of students in, in the University of Texas from backgrounds in South Asia, uh, either parents or grandparents who came from Pakistan or India, right? And if you grew up in one of those majority white communities, to see people who clearly looked different than you and whose roots were in South Asia was inevitably going to, to, you know, create questions about, you know, where are your people from and, and how is your life different than mine? And sometimes students would say, well, where are you from? And often... You know, the answer was, well, I'm from Houston, but my parents came from, you know, Mumbai or something like that. And and because students were often wary about how to ask those questions without insulting or being alienating, sometimes those questions didn't get asked. So what I tried to encourage in students is don't be afraid to ask, but be aware that you might ask in a way that isn't necessarily appropriate. And so you have to learn. Uh, But if we're all too scared of saying the wrong thing, then that curiosity gets damped down. And so we have to be willing to take chances. Uh, And we also have to be willing to learn. Uh, And, you know, part of the the so-called culture wars these days have made all of this very fraught and made people very anxious. How do we break through that? Well, I think, you know, we try to break through it by being authentic, by 
you know, admit, being able to admit mistakes and try to correct our behavior, but to not give up what you identified mm-hmm. as so important, which is that curiosity about the world, about other people, about other cultures. Um, that's the, the way we might overcome some of these, you know, polarizing effects we see today. Mm-hmm. I find as a woman, right, we see the world through particular layers of inferiority that have been constantly proselytized to us, right? Like we're constantly tell, telling ourselves, you need to make space, you know, and, the, and if you grew up in whatever home, I, I think even in white communities, a lot of women have a lot of ways that they shrink themselves to make space for male dominant ideas right Mm -hmm. so how did you bring your female students to be more willing to take space and your um and how do you invite your male students to create those spaces that perhaps wasn't natural or you know familiar well i think you know in teaching as well as in life parenting everything we realize that People pay attention to what we do more than what we say. So we, mo- we try to model behavior that we want others to emulate. So in this case, if I want, for instance, men not to talk over women, and I, if I want men to be better at listening, I have to model that behavior my, myself. I have to not talk over other students, especially over female students. I have to, as a teacher, be willing to listen. And so I think that's a big part of it. But in in smaller classes uh, that were discussion-based, I taught both big lecture classes and small discussion classes, I would always talk about this very explicitly. I would say, listen, to have a productive discussion in a class of 20 students, we have to be aware of dynamics. Not that every woman defers to men or that every man talks over women, but that these are patterns we see. So if you're a man, I would say, before you immediately leap into the conversation, Take a minute, take a breath, and see if others want to contribute first. And when others are talking, don't just prepare your response, but really listen. You know, I also pointed out that whether it's male or female, some people are shy, some people are more aggressive. And instead of the aggressive people dominating, it's good for folks who are quick verbally to take a minute. And no matter what the gender, um, you know, listen before you speak. Uh, train yourself to not always jump in first. Now, I'm a loudmouth, and so I had to, you know, learn that myself and try to, to model that myself. But, you know, I, th- I think that's always the first rule of parenting is what you say is much less important than what you do because your children are paying attention to what you do. And that, I think, extrapolates into teaching and it extrapolates into life more generally. Uh, you know, we have to to really try to live the values we claim to hold. And that's not always easy. And the most important thing, especially for people like me, you know, I'm white, I'm male, I'm American, I'm, you know, educated, uh, is that we're used to always assuming we're correct. And the most important thing is for us to learn how to check that arrogance and how to listen when people criticize us. Uh, For me, the first experience of that was in feminism and having to train myself to listen to women when they called me up on my bad behavior. Um, And it was painful. I'm not saying any of this is easy. But we know that that's what it means to be a decent person, to be accountable for our mistakes. And unfortunately for people like me who are white, male, American, middle class, we usually have a lot of mistakes we need to be accountable for. Uh, But that's also, of course, the joy of living is to be able to change, to grow, and um, to connect to other people. For instance, I'm sure we would have never talked if I had not wanted to be part of that process. Mm. And knowing you, Sylvia, and and talking to you on your show has enriched my life. So Mm. uh, it's not just that, you know, I want to be a good person. It's in my own self-interest to be able to you know, be accountable because I get to meet cool people like you. Mm, thank you. Um, as we come to the end of our show, um, what would be your hope, desire, message, words of encouragement, perhaps 
for women who are, you know, engaged daily, yeah. you know, yeah. in this process. Of yeah. Well, one of the first things I learned through work in feminism, and for me that was the feminist anti-pornography movement and the challenge to men who regularly engage in the sexual exploitation of women. The first thing I learned from that movement was that my job wasn't to talk to women so much as it was to talk to other men. I would challenge men to be self-critical, both individually and collectively, and ask, what are the things I do, you know, the kind of ways I've been socialized, what I've taken to be normal? Um, what's potentially harmful to women about that, and how can I change and contribute to the feminist struggle by changing myself and holding other men accountable. So I tend to think of what feminism has to say to men. Uh, women, of course, take feminism in all sorts of ways. There are different forms of feminism. Uh, and and I try to avoid telling women what to think and uh, spend my time being self-critical, both uh, as an individual and as as a man speaking to other men. So uh, I guess my thoughts on Women's Day are about how men should start challenging ourselves. Mm. Thank you. Uh, now, yeah. we are at the end of our show, and I'd like to give you a chance to perhaps just give us a little glimpse of your inconvenient apocalypses mm. and why you were excited about this book. Yeah. So uh, the full title of the book is An Inconvenient Apocalypse, uh, environmental Collapse, Climate Crisis, and the Fate of Humanity. So I, if that is a pretty sweeping title. <laughs> and what Wes Jackson and I are trying to do in that book is be kind of brutally honest about exactly how deep a hole we are in when it comes to the ecological crises. Uh, and some people say, well, that's pretty depressing. And what Wes and I are trying to argue is that's not depressing. That gives us an honest account of the world from which we can start to make reasonable plans for ourselves and for the future. Uh, and what Wes and I conclude, as many others have, is we are facing dramatic changes, whether we like it or not, in the way humans organize themselves on this planet. Things like uh, a future that is going to be defined not by expansion, because of course the capitalist story is ever expanding economic growth, but defined by contraction, by less, by less energy, less material resources that we use, less consumption. Um, now, of course, we know consumption is not equitable or equally distributed, but all of us are going to have to come to terms with a world that's defined by, by less. Now, some people think that's very distressing, and of course, it is going to be a difficult transition. But there's also a sort of joy in realizing that we can live very fulfilling lives without a lot of the things we've taken to be, you know, essential, like smartphones and video games and uh, a thousand other things. So Wes Jackson and I, we're both older, we're both coming to the end of our lives, and we're trying to, to sort of speak bluntly about what's coming and how it can be a source not only of conflict and distress, but a, a, a source of joy as well. Mm. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. How can people access your book? Well, uh, if you just put my name, Robert Jensen, into a search engine, uh, you can find on my homepage uh, not only information about the books, but uh, articles that are available for free. Um, so just put Robert Jensen into your favorite search engine, and uh, it's all right there. Fabulous. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Latin Waves. Latin Waves is an independently produced syndicated radio program made available for free to campus and community radios and also to the world at latinwavesmedia.com. Please visit the website to hear previous shows, hear about upcoming events, and consider becoming a member for as little as $1 per month.